The focus of this unit is on thermochemistry. Thermochemistry is the study of connections between chemical reactions and chemical change, energy, heat, and work. And thermochemistry has a number of important practical applications. If we want to talk about the connection, for example, between chemical reactions and work, we need to look no further than cars. Chemical reactions power our automobiles, whether they're driven by fossil fuels or electric. The burning of a fossil fuel inside an internal combustion engine, of course, is historically how we've powered our cars. But even an electrically powered car is driven by a redox reaction occurring inside of a battery. So in both cases, a chemical reaction is driving the work needed to propel the car forward. There's a connection between chemical reactivity and motion there. And of course, we as humans have been taking advantage of the connection between chemical reactions and heat for millennia now in the form of fire. A chemical reaction occurring inside this lighter is essentially being transduced into heat given off by the flame. And the example of the car and the lighter bring a number of questions to mind immediately. What is the connection, quantitative and conceptual, between the chemical reactions occurring in both cases and the amount and extent of work or heat we can expect to get out of these processes? We can understand that in quantitative terms, and we can relate that to chemical structure and chemical change. We'll focus mostly on the first goal in this chapter, and over the course of your Chem 1 and, and Chem 2 education, you'll develop and, and work towards the second goal as you develop a deeper understanding of chemical structure. So we need to know some things about chemical structure before we can make those connections to how structure relates to energy, heat, and work, but that's really a long-term goal of your entire introductory chemistry experience that's worth beginning to think about now and keeping in mind throughout the remainder of your chemistry courses. So let's start with a broad overview of what we're going to be discussing in this chapter. First, we're going to look at some basics of the concept of energy. Energy is a central concept in thermochemistry and thermodynamics more broadly, and we need a really solid understanding of energy really before we can proceed. From there, we're going to look at a method for measuring energy changes in chemical reactions, particularly heat flows, called calorimetry. Calorimetry is a nice context to study thermochemistry because we get useful quantitative information out of it, but it also helps us think conceptually about chemical systems, their surroundings, the interactions between them, and how heat flows and energy flows happen when a chemical reaction takes place. Finally, we will take a deep dive into the concept of enthalpy, which is a form of heat evolved or absorbed in chemical reactions that we can generalize. This is a thermodynamic state function with very important general properties. So we'll define what we mean by enthalpy, we'll talk about how to measure it, and we'll talk about how to calculate it if we know some things about the enthalpy of the components of a chemical system, but we don't know or are unable to measure things about our system of interest. We can take advantage of what's called Hess's law to be able to do that. Reason from some information to a new piece of information without ever running a new, for example, calorimetry experiment. Let's start with some basics about energy. And really a good place to begin is to make sure that we're comfortable with the definition of thermochemistry. Now, when, in looking at this word, thermochemistry, it has two components. Thermo, referring to heat, and chemistry referring to chemical change. So thermochemistry then is simply the study of heat absorbed or released during chemical changes as well as physical changes occurring in chemical substances. So these are things like phase transitions, the transition of a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, for example. In any chemical or physical process, energy is going to be transferred. And energy is the capacity of a system to supply heat or do work. This definition in terms of these two components, heat and work, is important to keep in mind, and we're actually going to put this into equation form here shortly when we talk about the first law of thermodynamics. And we can divide energy up conceptually a number of different ways. One of the most important distinctions, which is fundamental to physics, to mechanics, is this distinction between the energy of motion, which we call kinetic energy, and the energy associated with the position of a system or particles within a system relative to one another. That's called potential energy. Nothing needs to be moving 
for a system to have potential energy. It has to do with the interactions between particles within a system or between systems. And the distances, for example, between the particles or between the systems. And so energy we find in a number of different places. Our food has energy, for example. Energy is expended as we drive our cars. Energy can be expended when chemical reactions take place. These are all situations in which we can find energy. What we call thermal energy is distinct from heat. Thermal energy and heat are not the same thing. We'll return to this point a little bit later. Thermal energy can be found within a system, and it's specifically defined as the kinetic energy associated with random motion of particles within a system. And this word random and its connection to thermal energy is very important. Particles are always moving within systems that are not at absolute zero. The kinetic energy associated with that random motion is thermal energy. And temperature is conceptually related to thermal energy. It's the average kinetic energy of those random motions, associated with those random motions. This is most straightforward to understand for an ideal gas, where we essentially ignore potential energy inside the system. All the gas particles are moving with some average kinetic energy. That average kinetic energy is directly related to the temperature. They're not exactly the same thing, but they are proportional in an ideal gas. The extent of thermal energy in a chemical system depends on the state of matter of the system. And you may have seen this before, but I wanted to highlight it using a simulation. In the solid state, thermal energy is relatively low, and we can see the particles inside this hypothetical solid are moving a little bit. There's a little bit of jiggling going on here, but not much. They're moving relatively slowly. In the liquid state, qualitatively, there's a significant change. Now the particles are still attracted to each other. They're not moving super quickly, and they are sort of still bunched together, but they show quite a bit more motion than in the solid state. For example, the individual particles can flow, can move across one another, where they basically stay put in the solid state. And of course, in the gas phase, well, now the particles are interacting with each other only very weakly, if at all, and the average velocity and the average kinetic energy of the particles is much greater. So thermal energy is related to that velocity, that kinetic energy, and it tends to go up as we go from solid to liquid to gas. Another thing you may have noticed is that the temperature increased. That temperature increase corresponds to the increase in kinetic energy of the particles inside each state of matter. Now heat is not the same thing as thermal energy. Heat is not thermal energy itself. Heat is the transfer of thermal energy from one body or one system to another. And the key word in this definition is transfer. Heat corresponds to a transfer or a change in thermal energy between one system and another. And we know from practical experience, from everyday life, that heat seems to flow spontaneously from a hotter body to a colder body until the two bodies are at equal temperatures, at which point we've achieved what's called thermal equilibrium. So if we let a cold body, say some ice, come into contact with a hot body, some hot water, heat transfer will occur more or less continuously until we hit a point where the ice, if there's any left, and the water are at an equal temperature, and that's thermal equilibrium. To further understand heat, we can recognize the difference between heat and thermal energy as a difference between the state of a system and a process. Thermal energy is a state function. It really belongs to the state of a system. If we've got a system in a particular state, the positions and velocities of all of its particles are well-defined, we can calculate the thermal energy of that system. On the other hand, heat is associated with a process, the transfer of thermal energy from one system to another. So heat is what we'll call a path or process function. It depends on the character of a process going from some initial state to some final state. Now, two important terms on the bottom of this slide that you may or may not have heard before that we will absolutely see again, exothermic and endothermic. When a process occurring in a system releases heat 
to the surroundings so that the heat with respect to the system is negative, the process is called exothermic. And if, for example, we're touching the system and we're feeling the heat flow, we will feel our hand heating up. For example, the flame burning in the lighter. There's an exothermic process occurring there. On the other hand, a process in which the system absorbs heat so that the heat with respect to the system is positive is called endothermic. And the surroundings feel that process as cold, right? You grab a, a block of ice. It's going to feel cold on your hand because the ice as a system is absorbing heat from your hand. We can think about these in the context of physical changes, as we have been with the ice, or chemical changes, as we have been with the flame. Exothermic and endothermic. Keep these terms in mind.